Good, Good afternoon. Three o'clock today on uh, Wednesday. Welcome to the Gaming Hold webinar, Practical Solutions for Separating Player Funds. The Dutch online gambling regulations, among other things, stipulate license operators must keep separate player funds separated from their own risk bearing capital. Player funds, moreover, must be deposited with the Netherlands Licensed Bank or otherwise be subject to Dutch banking regulations. Unfortunately, banks in the Netherlands are currently generally uncooperative with regards to opening a bank account for online gambling companies or to provide banking guarantees to such firms. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the relevant regulations as well as practical solutions for keeping player funds separated. Before we kick off for today's webinar, I would like to thank our strategic partners and sponsors. Without their support, we would not be able to do this. Thank you very much. As always, our webinars are interactive. If you would like our speaker uh, to ask our speakers one or more questions, please submit them through the Slido app. Uh, you may have seen it in one of the previous webinars. Scan the QR code, then enter the event code GIH in the Slido app and then click the Q&A tab to submit your questions. You can also upvote questions you see from other people and you can do this throughout the webinar. We'll deal with the questions in more or less half an hour from now. With us today, we have three expert speakers, each of whom has valuable in insights to contribute. We have Frank Tolboom, partner at law firm Kalf, Katz & Fransen. Hey, Frank. We have Kejan Avis, director at EM Group Netherlands. And we have Karen Bermer, business development manager at EM Group Netherlands. Welcome and thank you very much for being here. Very glad to have you here and to discuss some interesting things with you. Frank, um, Let's start with you. Uh, hope everything is well in uh, Amsterdam. All good. Thank you, William. Thank you for asking. Yeah, Let's start by looking at specific rules and regulations regarding separating player funds. Frank, could you tell us more about the specific regulatory requirements regarding the separation of player funds from an operator's risk bearing capital? Yes, so <clears throat> as you've mentioned, uh, the, the, the player credits should be separated and the legal basis is stipulated in Article 31L of the Betting and Gambling Act. And this has been further detailed in secondary regulations and the policy rules of our regulator. Um, <clears throat> according to Article 430 of the Remote Gambling Decree, basically operators are required always and at any time uh, to pay out player credits. And uh, the rationale obviously is to prevent a um, Black Friday scenario. Most of you know, or at least if you're in the poker industry, this happened in 2011 when uh, US authorities seized the domain name of Tilt next to PokerStars and others. But whilst PokerStars has clearly separated the funds from their capital, uh, Full Tilt did not, and they were not able to cash out all of the player funds uh, to the players in, uh, in the US, uh, presumably because the funds were in the pockets of the shareholders. So this is something which uh, regulators have tackled, and <clears throat> uh, most of the jurisdictions have their requirements, regulatory requirements on this. The Netherlands has also introduced uh, such a requirement, but as we're going to discuss later on this webinar, it's a little bit different compared to other member states. Um, but in any case, as part of the application, um, applicants need to convince the Dutch Gambling Authority that the funds are sufficiently separated from other capital. And uh, there are a couple of options and the re regulatory requirements very much depend on which solution is chosen. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. That was quite uh, clarifying. Black Friday, 10 years ago, that's, um, that seems like yesterday. Uh, anyway, over to the solution, uh, to the next question and to the solutions there. Frank, could you explain what specific solutions the Netherlands Gambling Authority suggests for meeting the requirement you have just mentioned? Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> Article 7 of the Remote Gambling Policy Rule uh, mentions four options, basically. And the first option is a insurance uh, by means of a bank guarantee. 
Uh, this seems pretty straightforward, but as we're going to discuss later, there are some practical difficulties with this uh, solution. Uh, the second option is a uh, third party funds account, also held at a bank. But also the same practical difficulties apply to this option. And the third option is a uh, third party funds uh, foundation. And Karin and uh, Kees Jan will discuss this later on in this webinar. And the fourth option is basically any alternative uh, solutions which the operator comes up with. Uh, the only main disadvantage of this option is that it could result in a delay in the application process. Uh, and this could be, result in a delay up to six months. Why? Because the gathering authority then need to assess whether this solution uh, as offered by the operator meet all of the requirements. And they also note that they maybe even a need to hire external experts. So this is not something which we would recommend. Um, yeah, turning to, to the regulatory requirements, I will not go into all of the, the nitty gritty details, but let's focus on what needs to be submitted uh, when you apply for a license. Let's say you opt for a bank guarantee, but then you need to uh, provide a agreement between uh, the applicant and the bank to the gambling authority, um, as well as, and this is important, uh, it's evidence that this bank, uh, as you already mentioned, is licensed to operate in the Netherlands or is permitted to passport its services into the Netherlands. And, uh, yeah, this, this proof can be submitted on the basis of a PDF from the, the central bank, so the register of the central bank. Um, the issue is that, uh, <clears throat> well, there are not many foreign banks which are permitted to passport its service into the Netherlands, or at least has not arranged for a notification and authorization to passport the service into the Netherlands, especially not many Maltese banks. And on top of that, the Dutch banks, as you already mentioned in your introduction, are also reluctant uh, nowadays to open a bank account for operators. It is not just applied to uh, online operators entering the market, it also applies to existing operators, also land-based operators, which would like to enter the online market. So this is a, uh, well, an important stumble block for the, for the industry. Uh, and the same applies also to, to the escrow uh, account, the, the third party funds account. And then the third option uh, is, the, is the, the foundation. And if you opt for this solution, then you also need to submit the articles of association of this foundation, uh, as well as uh, certificates of good conduct of the board and the supervisory board, because this is a clearly an independent uh, body. Uh, it's separate from the operator and the operator needs to ascertain that the board and supervisory board are trustworthy. Uh, and then for all of the options, the applicants also need to uh, upload a player credit form, as they call it, into the part of the gathering authority, which basically is a declaratory form indicating which option is, is chosen. And uh, finally, uh, it's also important that the solution need to be signed off by an auditor. Uh, and whilst originally the auditor was required to provide an insurance report, the uh, gambling authority has softened this requirement a bit. So a so-called report of factual circumstances would also be sufficient. So it's basically an assessment by the auditor that, yeah, that the solution is in place. Having said that, the regulator finally, the uh, regulator has also luckily softened the requirement that the solution needs to be in place before the application is submitted. Uh, a grace period is being provided, meaning that applicants could also um, demonstrate the, the design of the, the solution and then later on upload or send the final documents to the regulator. They should, they should do this uh, no later than two months after the license is granted. 
So let's say the, the application process takes six months and uh, the operator has eight months until the go live date to, uh, yeah, to, to, to jump through all of the hoops, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Those are, in a nutshell, the key regulatory requirements, and I'm sure we're going to discuss the ins and, ins and outs later on. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Very interesting. Yes. Thing, uh, Before we move on to the next question, I would like to remind the viewers at home or in the office that you can submit your questions through the Slido app or website. Slido.com, enter the event code GIH, that's GIH. Next, select the Q&A tab on top of the screen, submit a question or a vote, somebody else has a question. Let's move on to the next participant here, Karen. Karen Boehmer from the Netherlands. How are you, Karen, today? How are you? Very well, thank you. And thank you for being here with us uh, at the webinar, Karen. Karen, as an expert in financial compliance services, could you tell us what, in your opinion, is the most practical solution for separating player funds? Um, yes, well, um, as Frank already explained, the, um, the KSA gives three options, not counting the other option, which, uh, which will cause some uh, delays. And those are the, uh, the banking guarantee, the third party funds accounts and the third party funds foundation. Um, from a service provider perspective, we have looked in detail at all three options. And in, in my opinion, all three could be solutions for different types of companies. Um, however, um, in our experience with online gambling and our talks with industry professionals, we have identified as um, uh, Frank already touched upon some issues with the first two options being the uh, third party account and the use of a, a banking guarantee. Um, first and foremost, um, these options require the involvement of a financial institution licensed to act as a bank in the Netherlands. Um, and are therefore basically only viable options for companies that already have a um, existing relationship with a licensed bank. And more often than not, companies do not have such a relationship as we all very well know how difficult it is to open any sort of a bank account for a company involved in online gambling um, in the Netherlands or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and also, there are some other difficulties um, with the guarantee questions arise, such as to whom will the guarantee be provided, um, seeing that, that, that there are fluctuating funds involved, for which amount will the um, uh, guarantee be provided. Um, with regards to the third party funds account, as was, as was said, from a risk appetite perspective, Dutch banks are very hesitant to open, uh, to provide such accounts for companies other yeah. than law firms or notary firms. Um, and then when also online gambling is involved, the chances of banks currently willing to open them are yeah, slim to nothing, uh, basically. Um, and that is why actually we have identified the, um, the option of having a third party funds uh, foundation as the most viable option. And um, um, also therefore is the uh, product we offer to our clients. Um, as this would be a Dutch foundation incorporated in the Netherlands, we think that the Dutch factor is um, sufficiently involved and therefore the requirement of having a Dutch licensed bank as with the other two options is no longer a necessity. The, 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 um, the requirements will be um, um, met uh, sufficiently. And um, then also there's the factor that although a foundation requires um, more initial investment of the uh, operator due to the legal and the management requirements of the uh, foundation, um, yeah, the operator is more certain than in any other case that the administration of the uh, player funds is and remains compliant. And we all, all know yeah. also how important that is nowadays. Um, yeah, and finally also, uh, uh, the Dutch online gambling license is a new product for the Dutch government. Uh, they have a very strong desire for this new license not to attract any negative attention whatsoever. And additional supervision, um, we think, uh, in the form of a foundation will be uh, welcomed. Yeah. Karen, that was really um, helpful. Um, stay with us. We're moving to Kejan for now and we'll see you back in, uh, in a minute. Okay, Sean, uh, welcome for joining Thank us you, today Willem. here at the webinar. How are you? 
I'm good, thank okay, you. Done. Good, good. Sorry. Good. Following up on the previous question to Karen, could you explain in greater detail the characteristics and legal status of, of the suggested third party funds foundation? In Dutch, you would say Stichting Derdengelden. Uh, yes, well, I'm more than happy uh, to do so. Um, uh, these details are basically broken down into elements uh, and they derive from the fact that uh, uh, the Dutch foundation as an entity in, under Dutch law is, a, is considered an independent entity. Um, it does not have any owners or uh, shareholders and for that matter, uh, by operation of law, uh, operates as an independent uh, organization uh, itself. Um, it's actually a well-known concept already within uh, uh, finance structures uh, wh where you see orphan types of structures which should be bankruptcy remote from the financiers compared to the object that is, uh, that is being financed. So as such, the, the Dutch Foundation is an internationally known and rep reputable uh, uh, concept already. Um, the second element is basically the third party uh, account uh, uh, concept. Uh, as Karen and Frank already mentioned, the third party account itself is uh, designed for lawyers and notaries uh, uh, in the Netherlands only, and as such is not uh, very much open to other, uh, other professions, uh, uh, so to speak. So um, basically the third party account foundation combines the two, uh, given the fact that the foundation itself is, is fully independent by operation uh, of law, and uh, as a consequence of that, the account it uh, it operates is uh, is also independent and as such uh, completely separated from any operator uh, uh, and its risk bearing capital, which is uh, a criteria and a qualification under the uh, regulatory guidance that we currently have. Yeah. Thank you, Kezian. Uh, very interesting. I will see you back in a minute. Again, before we move to the next question, I would like to remind you at home that you can submit your questions through the Slido app. Visit slido.com, enter the event code GIH, select the Q&A tab, and ask your question or upvote somebody else's question. Uh, that will be the interesting part in about 10 minutes uh, here. Returning to you, Karen. Um, let's see if we can get Karen visible. Here, yes, Karen, returning to you, could you explain in a bit more detail how exactly a third party fund foundation is managed? Um, yeah, so, um, well, as I said earlier, the uh, foundation has some uh, legal requirements. Um, um, all third party fund foundations, either connected to online gambling or other businesses, have to have a board of at least two directors and they have to be um, natural persons. Um, these directors do not have to be um, experts in uh, online gambling, but they, they do have to have some knowledge of corporate governance and these types of foundations. Um, in other words, yeah, they, they must know how such a foundation works and how to manage them in the, uh, the Dutch legal and corporate landscape. Um, also very, very important in that respect is that in, in order to really separate the player funds from the, from the operators, um, the directors must be um, completely independent from the, uh, from the operator. Um, and then also important for the management of the, uh, of the foundation is that um, um, there has to be a supervisory board in place. Um, and this supervisory board must consist of an uneven amount of individuals and at least three individuals uh, must be appointed. Um, well, in, in my opinion, these, these individuals cannot be connected to the board members as um, um, all possible conflict of interest or even the appearance thereof um, must be avoided. And also the supervisory board as the board of directors must at least have basic knowledge of a third-party funds foundation, the, the more the better, of course, and its operation, um, as well as knowledge of the online gambling market in order to be able to effectively supervise the board. If there is no knowledge there, it will become very difficult if you have to, you know, make the, 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 the quick connections um, um, in case something, uh, some issues arise. 
um, you cannot um, um, have um, that you have to explain what is going on. Um, um, the basic the basics have to be known already. Um, um, yeah. And also, as with the directors, the uh, supervisory board members must be independent from the operator. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. And apologies, I changed the order of the uh, questions unintentionally. Uh, apologies no for confusing. Let's go back to Case Jan. Um, there was another question pending to you, and sorry uh, again. Um, could you explain? Could you tell us a bit more about how payments are transferred between the third party funds foundation and the operator? Uh, yes, of course. Um, roughly speaking, there are two scenarios that are, uh, that are possible. Uh, uh, one scenario being that the, uh, the foundation as such is fully integrated within the payment operations between the operator uh, and the, uh, the Dutch players and as such becomes uh, a part of the, the, the payment platform and basically serves as some kind of co-merchant between the payment uh, service provider, the operator and, and the Dutch player. Uh, this is a very operational uh, type of type of role, and we feel that this uh, scenario is is undesir undesirable from an operational perspective, as it's uh, quite complicated to arrange and uh, uh, implement, and might serve as a burden within the existing operations already uh, already in place. Um, at the same time, we also feel that this is not a necessity given the uh, regulatory environment because that's aimed at guaranteeing and safeguards the player funds uh, 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 as such. And it's also different from what we see in other EU jurisdictions that already implemented similar, uh, similar types of law. Um, we therefore see uh, another scenario uh, and that's the uh, foundation maintaining somewhat as a, a buffer account, meaning that on a weekly basis, it is established uh, what the actual player funds outstanding are per, uh, per operator. Uh, and on this weekly basis, some kind of cash sweep basically takes place between the foundation and the payment uh, service provider or the operator uh, itself. And then on a weekly basis, it's established whether additional funds sh should be guaranteed within the foundation or uh, uh, limited uh, funds are to be guaranteed uh, via the, the, the foundation. Um, and we currently work from an understanding that uh, a buffer amount of 110% of the uh, uh, player amounts outstanding per operator should suffice in order to guarantee the uh, to provide for the guarantee that's that's designed in the, in the law at uh, at this point in time Willem. yeah uh, quite quite clear quite a useful case Jan. and thank you for that um final question here today is directed to all of today's speakers uh welcome back frank and uh, karen uh, are there any remaining regulatory uncertainties regarding the management of player funds and how can any additional or future requirements be addressed on an ongoing basis? Looking at all, all of you for some uh, expert advice here, maybe Karen or Frank to start with? Well, okay, Jan. I think, I think um, there are actually um, um, some uncertainties uh, left. Um, the guidelines uh, provided by the KSA are actually very clear and um, the, the framework is, uh, is very clear about uh, what they uh, want to achieve. Um, it's just that it's a, it's a new solution, um, it's a new license and um, the details in um, how the KSA wants to, wants to see the details um, filled out, that's not yet clear for, um, for, for us at this, uh, at this moment. Um, so there are many different options that could be, um, that, uh, that, that could be um, uh, provided to the KSA at this moment. Um, and um, which one will, would, will be preferred? Um, yeah, this is something that uh, the KSA will have to uh, answer. Yeah. Yeah, my friend. <coughs> yeah, I would like to add that <coughs> indeed is not much level of detail in terms of guidance. Also, we've uh, we've assisted a number of clients with the first batch of applications, and 
we received a question of, well, is there, are there any templates available on uh, the agreement which should be uh, submitted between a bank and the government authority or even the, the foundation and, the, and the applicants? And uh, those are not available. <clears throat> and we've now also uh, received some feedback after the first applications were submitted that even a copy of a bank guarantee was not uh, permitted. Uh, there, should, there should be really a separate uh, agreement between the bank and applicants. But uh, unfortunately, the regulator was reluctant to give a little bit more detail. Okay, what should be in their agreement? Of course, in a, the policy rule, a number of elements are noted, which in any case need to be included. But uh, there's still uh, some some yeah unclarity on. Yeah, the level of detail and <clears throat> that could raise some questions uh, during the application process and uh, hopefully some of those will be mirrored out with the first batch and hopefully uh, this is the second question how how this will be addressed on an ongoing basis hopefully the government authority will yeah, publish more information on their website as they are doing now with the q and a's but it's still very much limited and i'm hoping that uh, if they <clears throat> That they will not just send feedback to just one operator, but also upload it uh, on their website so it's available to all of the, the operators out there. Frank, is there anything to add or Karen? No, I, I have nothing to uh, to add. The, the the further guidance on the uh, operation and the details is appreciated. Yes. And thank you for answering this uh, quite interesting. Before we know, a quick reminder to you that you can scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen and add your questions to the Q and R that uh, to the. Um, Q&A that we're about to start uh, right now, you vote GIH and either ask your question or upvote somebody else's question. Um, let's move to the first question here. And we have the first question from Peter Paul de Goei of Noga. Online. Is it possible under Dutch law to construe a legal obligation for Dutch banks to provide banking services to legit Dutch based gambling operators? Well, that's, uh, that's a very good question that would, uh, would solve the issue in regards to uh, the, the first option of the bank guarantee. Um, I haven't properly thought about it, but my preliminary analysis would be that it's going to be very difficult uh, because there is a contractual freedom, of course. Banks can accept clients who they wish. They can't, in principle, not be forced to accept clients. Uh, this could be different if or when there would be a strong legal basis for them to do so, I would say. But that legal basis is not... Uh, governed in the Betting and Gambling Act, nor the secondary regs, nor the policy rules. So I'm afraid that uh, it would not be possible under the, the existing circumstances. Um, or perhaps Karen or Kajan has additional views as they are experts in the uh, financial services industry. Yeah, but, um, thanks, uh, Frank. Karen, what, any what we... Yeah, what we typically see is that banks uh, and especially their risk models have uh, have changed over the, the, the past years, whereby uh, uh, any association with online gaming, let alone gambling, is uh, is very difficult to uh, to start up a relation with uh, uh, w with a bank, basically a new relation, but even continuing an existing relation. Um, and at the same time, uh, within the question, it, it it lays down: can it open? Uh, can it work for a legit business? At the same time, the legitimacy of the business is part of the application process. So it's a chicken and egg story to uh, to some extent, in my view. Yeah. Okay. 
That's quite clear. Thank you, Kejian. Let's move to the next question here from Slido, from the audience. Um, can we have the next question, please? I'm sure there's more questions. Uh, I guess we're looking at the tech. Ah, here, here we are. So we have an anonymous person asking the following question. What will it take for banks to become more cooperative? What is their perceived legal exposure? Maybe it goes slightly behind the scope of this uh, webinar. Um, because we look at solutions here rather than understanding the problem more. But maybe Frank, you can make a small, shorter comment. <clears throat> yeah, well, in terms of legal exposure, uh, there's not any legal exposure uh, compared to, to, to other industries and sectors if and when they uh, provide services to, to licensed operators. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm also a bit uh, surprised why Deutsche banks uh, are reluctant to enter into uh, an agreement with uh, yeah, prospective uh, licensed operators. And even they're reluctant to do business with uh, licensed offline gambling operators. Obviously, there are other, other developments, uh, but yeah. <clears throat> then again, I don't think there there's an additional exposure for the gambling industry compared to to, to other industries. And um, yeah, I think it would make sense uh, that uh, that the Netherlands Banking Association uh, will uh, will <clears throat> discuss this with their members. Which, They've already done, I think, and as I think it's also important that the gambling authority, as well as the ministry, uh, will try to push the Netherlands Banking Association to uh, to be less reluctant to enter into uh, an agreement with uh, operators. Yeah. And thank you, Frank. Let's keep following this topic uh, over the course of the next few months with additional applications coming into the KSA. Let's see if we can look at the third question from the Q&A, Slido Q&A here. You can still put your questions in Slido or upvote other people's questions. Uh, let's have a look at the third question. I guess we have the internet being a bit bumpy this afternoon. So let's see if we can deal with that. I'm sure there's more questions. Um, um, can we have a look at the next question, please? There must be more questions. I guess we have a technical issue here with the incoming questions from Slido. Um, can somebody please ping me questions from Slido so I can read them to our expert panel? Is that possible? Please be patient for a moment while we look at, I'm sure, excellent questions we have coming in now. One second, I think we're getting something here. And apologies for this slight delay. Um, yeah, so there's a question here um, yeah, so. from an anonymous uh, person. Could you give an indication regarding cost, initial and ongoing for party funds foundation? I guess it depends on many circumstances. Maybe you can say something indicative about this, uh, Karen or uh, Kejian? Uh, yes, of course. Um, no. <laughs> in, in, indeed, costs associated uh, uh, very much depend on the, uh, the actual implementation and what scenario is being applied. I uh, lined out two, uh, two, two possible scenarios there. Um, what we can say is there are various cost components involved. Uh, first uh, cost component is the, the setup of the structure itself. 
that's a, uh, that's a setup cost, which is a notarial charge basically. Um, and for the operate operation and the management of the foundation, um, you have the, uh, the, the board of directors that, uh, is a cost in itself, the supervisory board that, uh, normally receives a remuneration for, uh, for its service. And then it's the, it's, it's the governance structure. It's the weekly uh, cash sweep that needs to take place. So the exchange of information, how efficient can that be organized? Uh, and, uh, uh, last but not least, the foundation is required to be audited, to have, a, uh, another pair of eyes established that the finances of the foundation meet the requirements that are laid down in uh, first and foremost, the articles of association, but second of all, so the regulatory environment that, uh, that is in place. Um, and it's, it's impossible to put a, uh, to put a number at this, at this point in time. Uh, but those are basically the components that one uh, needs to take into account. Sure, we can go into deeper detail in one on one conversations here. So we have a next question here. How much of a delay yes. does a third party funds foundation add to the processing of uh, payments? I guess, Kees Jan, you, you've spoken about the topic there. Uh, is there something you can say about this? Uh, yes, I can. Um, and, uh, in my firm belief, the delay is zero because it's a separate, uh, line of funds, uh, basically, uh, at least in the second scenario that, uh, uh that I mentioned, uh, because there, uh, the, uh, the day to day operation between the player and the, the operator uh, remains intact. So there's, uh, there's no intrusion of the third party funds foundation there. It's just a, a, a separate uh, a line that on a weekly basis is established what the buffer should be at the third party funds foundation. So that's, uh, also kept separate from the operational nature of the, the, the normal activity between the operator and the player itself. Great. Thank you. Okay. Jan, that's quite clear. Um, can we have a next question, please? I have some here as well, but, um, um, I guess there's a compliance question from one of the audience members. What is the track record of third party funds foundations regarding fraud and compliance? How hard or how easy is it to abuse the system? Looking at Kees Jan and uh, Karen for this. Well, the uh, third party funds foundation is actually a known concept uh, uh, already because we see it oftenly used for uh, payment platforms such as Buckaroo or Atien that actually make use of the same uh, uh, mechanics. Uh, so as such, it's, it's known and, and, and tested. Um, and uh, I think the design of how the, the foundation is being operated with a, a board of director, directors being responsible for the day to day, uh, uh, subsequently a supervisory board of directors that basically oversees the operations of the board itself and a third layer of uh, safety with uh, audits being performed, uh, well, provides for more than sufficient safeguard that the system as such is, uh, is, is not abused, let alone the fact that from a, re a reputational perspective, it's of nobody's interest to, uh, to do anything uh, out of the ordinary to the, to that respect. Yeah. You have anything to add to that, Frank, uh, maybe, or leave it? Leave it at this. Well, no, <clears throat> yeah, the, the governance is obviously important and uh, just from an operator's perspective, it's important also towards the, the gambling authority that the operator ascertains the trustworthiness of the board and the supervisory board, that's, that's a requirement. So, but if that, uh, if the board and the supervisory board are also trustworthy uh, next to all of the other checks and balances and safeguards, which case Jan just mentioned, it's it's a safe option, which is also already commonly used indeed. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Frank. I guess we are nearing the end of the webinar. I think there's two quick questions we can address here. Um, it was addressed in the beginning of the webinar, but maybe it went too fast. What is the amount of bank guarantee as the player funds will be fluctuating? 
So I think Karen, you address that end for sure. Yeah, so that is that well, is something that uh, is to be determined. I'm sorry, Frank, go ahead. Yeah, it needs to be determined basically by the operator. And the requirement is that it's equal or more than the total sum of the player credits. But that's fluctuating. This, this also creates a layer of uncertainty. Uh, that to be safe, if and when an oil applicant would like to choose a bank guarantee, they, they should yeah, uh, set this uh, amount very high uh, to, to, to cover the player credits. Yeah, quite clear. Last question here from the audience here from Slido, and then we wrap it up. Who's the, who's the beneficiary of the bank guarantee? Frank, Karen, Kajian? Yeah, that's that's also one of the uncertainties that we have. So <laughs> that's that's not known at this moment. That's one of the issues that's that there are that there are with the uh, with the banking guarantee. Should it be you, you cannot provide a guarantee for each and every player separate. You cannot. Maybe it would be the KSA. Um, it's it's not clear at this moment. And that is why we uh, well, that, why we also think that. Um, the option uh, won't be um, viable well, <laughs> uh, to provide by the, uh, by the banks. Well, this question has been raised by a number of operators to the Gambling Authority and they uh, released an answer, which is not really an answer because they uh, uh, did not say whether it should be the Gambling Authority or the players or whatever. It should meet all of the requirements in the secondary regulations. Uh, so it's a bit unclear indeed still, and I, I assume that we will know more uh, within the next couple of months when the first applications are being assessed and processed. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully we'll have a follow-up on that um, during the summer here. So it is 15.42. I think we're running out of time. I, I think we... Uh, it's time to wrap this up. We had a bumpy internet connection, all of us here in the last uh, half hour. Um, these things happen. I hope people can see and look back at the post-webinar video that we'll be sending around uh, probably tomorrow uh, to, to clarify any uh, questions uh, of, of, of things that you could not follow during this webinar. As I said, it's the end of the webinar. I would like to thank Frank, Karen, and Keishan for answering uh, our viewers' questions. Thank you for appearing here. Um, a link to the recording of today will be shared in a post-webinar email that we'll be sending out probably tomorrow. Um, I'm sharing here at the screen also the direct emails of the expert speakers of today, Frank, Karen, and Keishan. Feel free to contact them directly about any questions, issues, or, or detailed uh, advice that you can uh, need from them. As always, let's keep in touch. If you have not signed up for the free newsletters and print magazines, please do so at www.gamingin.eu, that's gamingin.eu, or directly at gaminginholland.com. Please stay in touch, and I hope to see you again soon in person. Thank you very much.